Good morning and happy Sabbath, everyone. Good happy morning, Sabbath. church. Good morning. Wonderful to be with you. So our lesson today is offerings for Jesus. And offerings for Jesus come in all kinds of shapes size, and sizes, and we're going to spend time today talking about that. But before we get started, Greg, would you pray for us, please? Be my pleasure. Let's bow our heads. Gracious, kind, and heavenly Father, we thank you so much for a beautiful Sabbath where we could come to you and open your word. Lord, we ask and pray that you please send your Holy Spirit to be with us, to be with the AV team, Lord, who dedicates their time and their effort week after week to bring your word to people who are joining in online. And Heavenly Father, we ask and pray that you please bless us here. Please fill us with your Holy Spirit so that the words that we speak are your words, not of ourself, but from you. Falling on wanting and listening ears, help us to understand the key principles that you want us to take away and to apply in our lives and to share with others. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. 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 So our memory verse today comes from Psalms 116, 12 through 14. And it says, What shall I render to the Lord for all his benefits toward me? I will take up the cup of salvation and call upon the name of the Lord. I will pay my vows to the Lord now in the presence of all his people. So we find that besides tithes and offerings, uh, that come to the Lord from our possessions, that there are also, we have the tithes and then we have the offerings. So this is where our generosity begins, is with our offerings. Different types of offerings are given by God's people, such as sin offerings, given in response to God's grace, thank offerings, given to recognize God's protection and blessing of health, prosperity, and sustaining power. There are also were offerings for the poor, offerings to build and maintain his house of worship. Deuteronomy 18, 18, 18, 8, 18 says, And you shall remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you power to get wealth, that he may establish his covenant, which he swore to your fathers as it is that day. So God is the one who gives us the power to get wealth. So doesn't it make sense that we would want to thank him for doing that? This covenant can be kept only in a relationship of complete love with the whole heart, mind, and strength. And we see that coming in, in Deuteronomy 6.5. In the worship to God, offerings reveal the quality of our commitment and who we are as worshipers, as a faith exercise, offerings express our gratitude and strengthen our love for the Lord and for his cause. In the scripture, we see offerings must be given according to the blessing received and not merely based on a random percentage, disconnected from the giver's prosperity. So this is really comes, this, this offering really is something that comes from the heart. Deuteronomy 16, 17 says, every man shall give as he is able, according to the blessing, the Lord God, which he has given you. So additionally, in the Old Testament times, though there were voluntary offerings, also were essential and large parts of worships and feasts, where the worshipers were not allowed to come before the Lord empty-handed. So often at the feast, they had to come with gifts. And Deuteronomy 16:16 uh, 16, 16 tells us that three times a year, all your males shall appear before the Lord your God in the place which he chooses, at the Feast of Unleavened Bread, at the Feast of Weeks, at the Feast of Tabernacles, and they shall not appear before the Lord empty-handed. As such, worship and offerings are voluntary, but the first is accepted only if accompanied by the second. Worship and offerings are voluntary because they must be freely given, but they are mandatory in the same sense. They are a vital part of service to the Lord. So we see um, Moses says in uh, Exodus 1 and 2 that the Lord spoke to Moses saying, Speak to the children of Israel that they may bring me an offering from everyone who gives it willingly with his heart. You shall take my offering. 
So he, he, the Lord tells Moses, I want it to come from the heart. The offering from the heart is what's important to me. Voluntary means to do something to one's own free will without being pressured or compelled by someone else to do it. In general, the Bible tell us, tells us that voluntary worship, offerings in worship proportional to the blessings or possessions received were essential for worship. Thus, because of their essential nature, voluntary offer, offerings, not always optional, except if the person made the decision not to serve the Lord. So just in serving the Lord, the children of Israel were expected to, to bring their offerings to God because it was part of their, their relationship and it was part of their worship. <clears throat> the early believers were so liberal in their giving that they looked at nothing as their own. And if you look at the early church um, after Christ's resurrection and how they spread the gospel, they really didn't look at any of their their belongings as theirs, but it, they belonged corporately to the church. In Acts 4.32, we see, Now the multitude of those who believed were of one heart and one soul. Neither did anyone say that any of the things he possessed was his own, but they had all things in common. In verse 33, we see, And with great power the apostles gave witness to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon all of them. Nor was there anyone among them who lacked, for all who were possessors of lands and houses sold them, and brought their proceedings of things that were sold, and they laid them at the apostles' feet, and they distributed them, each one, as, as anyone had need. Can you imagine that? Giving up, selling your home, selling everything, and just living in common with God's people. So this unselfish liberality threw the early church into a transport of joy. And this comes from Acts of the Apostles, page 344. That <clears throat> transport of joy. For the believers knew that their efforts were helping to send the gospel to those in darkness. And that's part of the reason that the gospel went out so quickly. Their benevolence testified that they had not received the grace of God in vain. What could produce such liberality and sanctification of the Spirit in the eyes of the believers and unbelievers? It was a miracle of grace. Spiritual prosperity is closely bound up with Christian liberality. The followers of Christ should rejoice in the privilege of reveling in their lives the benefits of their Redeemer. As they give to the Lord, they have the assurance that their treasure is going before them to the heavenly courts. What a beautiful image. Our giving literally goes before the heavenly courts. So when we have a deep relationship with Christ and receive his abundant grace, <clears throat> he gives of his abundance. 2 Corinthians 9, 8 and 9 say, And God is able to make all grace toward you, that you always having all sufficiency, all things, may have an abundance, for every righteousness endures forever. So we see that, <clears throat> that this love that we have for Christ we show by giving. So, Victor, it's your turn. You're going to talk about motivation for giving. Absolutely. And, because uh, that's, that's important. Absolutely, and it follows through. I, I really um, want to tell you how <laughs> much I appreciate the introduction to the lesson. <clears throat> um, motivation for giving. Uh, the Apostle John tells us in 1 John 4.19, 1 John 4.19, that we love God, and you should know this by heart, because he first loved us. That's why we love God. This verse tells us that the love of God for us is resulted in our reciprocal love for God, which is natural, and a universally loving attitude on our part to others, to the world we live in. In other words, we love God and all other human beings because of the superlative love of God. 
Therefore, the motivation for giving is expressed in that universally loving attitude that overflows from us in response to God's amazing love. Ellen White in Councils on Stewardship, page 18, tells us, the Lord does not need our offering. Well, it's almost controversial, so why, why do we need to offer? And that, this is important. We cannot enrich him by our gifts, says Ellen White. In the same portion of, of, uh, of her writing, she says, the psalmist says, all things come to thee, and of thine own have we given thee. And that's very true. Everything we are and receive comes from God, and we give back to God. And then Ellen White uh, closes the, the statement uh, by saying the following. Yet God permits us to show our appreciation of his mercies by self-sacrificing efforts to extend the same to others. This is the only way in which it is possible for us to manifest our gratitude and love to God. He has provided no other. So when we surrender ourselves and everything that God has given us to him, this will strengthen our love for him and for our fellow human beings. It is appropriate to note that Jesus spent more time talking about money and wealth than just about any other subject. One verse in every six of the epistles of Matthew and Mark and Luke is about money. Money and wealth can be a real power for good when we entrust it to God. And that's why it is in Scripture. In Matthew chapter 6, verses 31 to 34, God makes an incredible promise to you and to me. Here's what God promises. Verse 31, do not worry. Do not worry saying, what shall we eat? Or what shall we drink? Or what shall we wear? Verse 32, for after all, these things the Gentiles seek. For, for your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. Now pay attention to verses 33 and 34. Verse 33. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, says the Lord, and all these things shall be added to you. Verse 34 says, Therefore do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about its own things. Our supply is guaranteed when I seek God and his righteousness. That's important. There is no such thing as security apart from God and citizenship in his kingdom. The best cure for worry is trust God. He says it in those verses. If we make the kingdom of heaven first in our thoughts and in our lives, God will take care of us as we walk through life with him. Our offerings and our gifts are an evidence of our love for God and our willingness to sacrifice self for God. Making an offering can be a deeply spiritual experience, an expression of the fact that our lives are wholly surrendered to God our Lord. An offering comes from a heart that trusts in a personal God who constantly provides for our needs as he sees best. Our offerings rest on the conviction that we have found assurance of salvation in Christ. Giving an offering is not an appeasement or a search for God's acceptance. It doesn't work that way. Offerings should flow naturally from a heart that has accepted Christ by faith as the only and sufficient means of grace and redemption. In 2 Corinthians chapter 9 verses 6 and 7, our Lord tells us, by this I say, he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. I hope you're paying attention. He who sows sparingly will reap sparingly. 
He goes on to say, and he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Verse 7, so let each one give as he purposes in his heart, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. Christ is asking us to give from the heart. Christian benevolence grows out of deliberate choice. Only that which comes from the sincere desire of the heart is acceptable to God. Christ is also asking us to give cheerfully. Giving needs to be done with a cheerful heart. If we give grudgingly, we give reluctantly. And this becomes giving that saddens the giver. Such gift, gift goes without the giver. And the reason for that is that there is no heart in it. The gift is accompanied by a regret to the giver. A cheerful giver is a happier giver and much more Christ-like. Our use of material goods reveals how much we love God and our neighbors. As we have already mentioned, money can be a power for good. Jesus tells us in Matthew chapter 25, 40, I tell you the truth, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers of mine, you did for me. From God's perspective, money has value. And money, as it is used, money should be mainly used to provide three things. The necessities of life, to bless others, and to support God's work. Ellen G. White, and I want to end with that statement. Ellen G. White in Patriarchs and Prophets, page 529, makes the following comment. God has made human beings his stewards. The property which he has placed in, the hands, uh, in their hands is the means that he has provided for the spread of the gospel. To those who prove themselves faithful stewards, he will commit greater truths. So love for God is the motivation. It is. It's the depth of our love that pours out in offerings. Sure so is. Greg, tell us about the portions. What, are, what portions should we be looking at? Okay, well, the portions that we're looking at is, it's very introspective that the Lord gives us guidance and direction on this. And as we go along, you'll see what we're talking about. So the title of today's lesson is Offerings for Jesus. And as we just started to say, the lesson really focuses on what portion do we give back in terms of offerings. But rather than looking at it based on a percentage basis, we want to look at the criterion that God gives us as a basis for the ability, the willingness, and the generosity of our offerings. And Victor really touched on the key foundational aspects of this. It is a love relationship with the Lord that guides us. But let's, let's go into this just a little bit deeper as well. So first, we'll look at several verses that help us to better understand the principal lessons that the Lord wants us to understand. And then secondly, we're going to ask ourselves, each of us, and believe me, going through this week's lesson, it made me ask myself a very important question that I'll be asking at the end of the lesson. So let's get right into it. So the question is, how much does the Lord desire from us when it comes to offerings? Well, again, let's look, either open up our Bibles if you have it in front of you, or if not, you could follow on the screen. And let's see, if we look at the uh, memory verse again. The memory verse is Psalms 116, 12 through 14. And I'm going to reread this. Verse 12, what shall I render to the Lord for all his benefits towards me? I will take up the cup of salvation and call upon the name of the Lord. I will pay my vows to the Lord now in the presence of all his people. So let me ask you this. Could we ever repay God for all the blessings that he has done for us? Well, obviously the, the answer to that question is no. But to answer that question in verse 12, we need to pray about it. Each and every one of us need to pray about that. We need to be thanking the Lord, first of all, for all the blessings and 
that we want to be able to share the blessings that he has provided with others on his behalf as well. And we want to ask the Lord to please touch my heart. Touch my heart to be a willing and cheerful, joyful giver. Deuteronomy 16, 17 gives us some guidance on this. So let's look at that. Deuteronomy 16, 17 says, Every man shall give as he is able, according to the blessings of the Lord your God, which he has given you. So the Lord tells us to give according to the blessings that he has given you. The point is, the amount of the offering we are able to give God is based on our relationship with him and the value we place on the blessings we have received. And we're not only talking about material blessings, financial blessings, you know, you get a high salary or, or things like that. But think about it in terms of God's blessings of salvation, his grace, his mercy, his forgiveness, his joy, and his peace that he brings us. And we also need to keep in mind a few principles. Let's keep in mind what the Lord tells us in Luke chapter 12, verse 48. For everyone to whom much is given... From him, much will be required, and to whom much has been committed, of him they will ask the more. But also, remember this. Those who may not have received an abundance of material blessings, let's remember the example of the widows and her two mites. In Luke chapter 21, verses 1 through 4, and I'll read. And he looked, this is Jesus, and he looked up and saw the rich Putting their, gifts, putting their gifts into the treasury, and he saw also a certain poor widow putting in two mites. So he said, truly I say to you that this poor widow has put in more than all. For all of these, out of their abundance, have put in offerings for God, but she, out of her poverty, put in all the livelihood that she had. And as Victor had mentioned earlier, and I'm just restating this because it's such an important point, our offerings are an acknowledgement and an expression of our love and gratitude to God for his blessings of life, redemption, sustenance, and all the other blessings that we had just mentioned before. This really is the principal lesson that God's trying to teach us. It's really an acknowledgement and our expression of our gratitude towards God for all the blessings that he has bestowed upon us. And by closely walking with the Lord, our joyful offerings contribute to the development of a Christ-like character. That's what he's trying to teach us and help us to change within us, whereby our hearts and our characters are changed from selfishness to selflessness in our love for God and our love for others. And as Barbara had mentioned earlier in the opening, it's up to us to determine what amount we give as an offering and who receives it. But I would add this caution for each of you listening and for each of us. Neglecting to do this, however, is not only a reflection of our gratitude towards God for the blessings he bestows upon us, but it also reflects our love for others who are less fortunate than ourselves. We can therefore very easily see the love relationship between our joyful and willing offerings and the two greatest commandments. And most of us, we know what those two greatest commandments are, but let's look at the scripture for those of you who are not quite familiar with that. The two greatest commandments can be found in Matthew 22, verses 36 through 40. Teacher, what is the greatest commandment of the law? And Jesus said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment, and the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. So you can see how our love for God and our love for our neighbor really becomes manifested in and reflected in the offerings that we give back to the Lord. And I love how Ellen White writes in Patriarchs and Prophets, page 527. She writes this, this is something I didn't realize until really going through this. I know you guys probably knew this already, but 
for me, it was, it was kind of a, an aha moment. Wow, I didn't realize this. And she says, in Patriarchs and Prophets, the contribution required of the Hebrews for religious and charitable purposes amounted to fully one-fourth of their income. One-fourth. Boy, it makes each of us ask, Lord, am, am, am I really valuing and evaluating the value of what you provide for me? Is it reflected in my offerings or not? And then in Testimonies for the Church, volume 2, page 574, I love this, how um, uh, Ellen White states this. God requires no less of his people in these last days in sacrifices and offerings than he did of the Jewish nation. Those whom he has blessed with a competency and even the widow and the fatherless should not be unmindful of his blessing, especially should those whom God has prospered render to him the things that are his. They should appear before him with the spirit of self-sacrifice. And Victor mentioned that, that self-sacrifice attitude. And bring their offerings in accordance with the blessings which he has bestowed upon them. But many whom God prospers manifest base gratitude to him. So in closing, the question for you and for me is, how much do we love the Lord? How much do we love our neighbor, especially the needy? How do your offerings and your attitude about giving reflect your relationship with God and with Jesus? And it's a very heavy inward search of our hearts, but we need to pray and ask the Lord to help us to convict our hearts, to remove our hearts of stone and create in us hearts of flesh, to change our hearts and minds from selfishness to selflessness based on our love for him. Amen. All right, thank you, Greg. Amen. We're going to get into a little bit now about offerings and worship. So the Bible doesn't really tell us about order of service, but we know that there were four things that were used for worship. <clears throat> it includes study, or they would stand up and read the word, preaching, prayer, song, and most of the time the song was about scripture, learning, helping them learn scripture, and learning how to praise God as well as tithes and offerings. And we talked about in our opening that three times a year, uh, each man or family of Israel were to appear to the Lord in Jerusalem. And when they went, they didn't go empty-handed. <clears throat> so in other words, parts of wor the worship experience was returning that tithe and giving offering. It was at Passover, Pentecost, and Feast of Tabernacles that God's children brought their tithes and offerings. It's hard to imagine uh, someone coming to any of those feasts empty-handed. So I want to talk about Feast of Tabernacles or Feast of Booths here for just a minute. And we see this story in uh, Leviticus 23, 33 through 44. And I'm going to read parts of it for time's sake. But um, we see in verse 33 that the Lord is speaking to Moses. And he tells him what day, it's the 15th of the seventh month, uh, we're going to have the Feast of Booze. And the Feast of Booze was a seven-day feast. So on the first day, it's a holy convocation, and they weren't to work. For seven days, they shall present offering by fire to the Lord. So they would do their sacrifice offering. The eighth day, you shall have another holy convocation and present an offering by fire to the Lord, it is an assembly. You're still, they weren't doing any work here. And we jump to verse 37, it says, There were appointed times for the Lord, which you shall proclaim the holy convocations and present these offerings, these burnt offerings by fire, sacrifice and drink offerings, each day matter in its own day. So, Every day they would have something specific they were doing. So besides the Sabbaths of the Lord, and besides the gifts, and besides all your vowed voluntary and voluntary offerings, which you give to the Lord, on exactly the 15th day of the seventh month, when you have gathered the crops of your land, you shall celebrate the feast of the Lord for seven days with a rest on the first day and a rest on the eighth day. So we see that, <clears throat> they had specific days of rest. They weren't to be working. 
And did you see those offerings, burnt offerings, grain offerings, sacrifices, drink offerings? They were bringing all these offerings to the Lord. <clears throat> and it says, now on the first day, you shall take yourselves the foliage of beautiful trees, palm branches, and branches of trees, and thick branches, and willows of the brook, and you shall rejoice before the Lord for seven days. So they literally set up booths that they would stay in and rejoice to the Lord. You shall celebrate. And these, actually, these were pretty elaborate. Uh, if you look at, at images of them, you can see that they, they would put uh, flowers and, and fruit and, and vegetables and all kinds of things they would, they would put on these. So you shall celebrate it, <clears throat> a feast to the Lord for seven days in the year. It shall be a permanent statute throughout your generations, and you shall celebrate it in the seventh month. You shall live in the booths for seven days. So they, they literally live there. And all the native born in Israel shall live in booths. And your generations may know that I had sons of Israel live in booths when I brought them out of the land of Egypt, for I am the Lord your God. So Moses declared to the sons of Israel the appointed time of the Lord. So we see in, this, in these feasts that there were several things that were happening. If they were resting and they were worshiping God, they weren't earning a living. They were giving of, of what they had in offerings. They, um, they spent, if, if we think about what the Feast of Booths is about, it's about being present with God. So it's about living with God. And so they gave up everything for these seven days to just spend time with God. So we see this praise to the fullness and sincerity of heart is as much a duty as prayer. We are to show the world and all the heavenly intelligences that we appreciate the wonderful love of God for fallen humanity and that we are expecting larger and yet larger blessings. Uh, Christ Objects Lesson says God imparts his gifts to us that we may give and thus make known his character to the world. Under the Jewish economy, gifts and offerings formed an essential part of God's worship. The Israelites were taught to devote a tithe of all their income for the service of the sanctuary. Besides this, they were to bring sin offerings, free will offerings, offerings of gratitude. These are means of supporting the ministry of the gospel for that time. God expect no less from us than he did from his ancient people. <clears throat> so, in other words, our offerings are, are really truly a part of worshiping God Amen. and giving gratitude to God. Uh, 1 Chronicles 16.29 uh, says, Give to the Lord the glory due his name. Bring an offering and come before him. O oh, worship the Lord in his beauty of holiness. And Psalms uh, 96, 8 and 9 says, Give to the Lord the glory due his name. Bring an offering and come into his courts. Another one, um, oh, in verse 9, Worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. Tremble before him all the earth. And then um, the last Psalm is 116, uh, 16 through 18. O oh, Lord, Truly I am your servant. I am your servant, the son of your maidservant. You have loosed my bonds. And see, that, that is so true. God loses, the, those, loses those bonds of sin that we're, that we're in. It's so beautiful. I will offer to you the sacrifice of thanksgiving and will call upon the name of the Lord. I will pay my vows to the Lord in the presence of his people. How do we apply the principles expressed here to our own worship experience? So as God's children who are tasked with the responsibilities of managing his business on the earth, it is a privilege, an opportunity, and a responsibility to bring our offerings. The Lord, if the Lord has given us children to raise for him, we should share that joy of, of tithing and offerings with them as well and bring them to Sabbath school. So returning tithes and offerings is truly part of the worship experience with God. Amen. You know, Barbara, that um, <clears throat> you, you, you really explained that pretty well, the amount of time that was spent with God through those offerings. That in itself is a great measure of stewardship. Mm 
Well, the, the offering of time exactly. that they spent That's exactly. literally building these That's booths exactly. and living in them That's and, exactly. and just reveling in being in God's and, presence. And the benefit and the blessing yeah. that they received. Just yeah. remarkable. It is. Thank you. Well, Wednesday's lesson, God takes note of our offerings. Well, <laughs> do you believe that? Do you really believe that God takes note of our offerings? Well, let's read a portion of Scripture. Let's introduce uh, Wednesdays by reading um, three or four verses, four verses. Mark chapter 12, verses 41 and 44. Mark 12, 41 and 44. Here's what Scripture says. Now Jesus sat opposite the treasury. By the way, the treasury and I'm, I'm reading from the New King James Version. The treasury is the place where the offerings were put. So really, this is the offering plate, if you like, from your understanding. So let's, uh, let's read verse 41 and go move on. Now Jesus sat opposite the treasury and saw how the people put money into the treasury. And many who, who were rich put in much. Verse 42. Then one poor widow came and threw in two mites, which make a quadrants. Now, this is equivalent in today's, uh, uh, in today's uh, monetary um, understanding at about one U.S. cent. One cent. So he called his disciples to himself. This is verse 43. He called his disciples to himself and said to them, Assuredly, I say to you that this poor widow has put in more than all these who have given to the treasury. For they all put out, put in out of their abundance. But she, out of her poverty, she put in all that she had, her all lively wood. So what, what message can we take from this story? What's the principle that this story teaches you and teaches me today? Jesus and the disciples were in the temple courtyard where the treasury chests were located. Scripture tells us that Jesus watched those who were bringing their gifts. He was close enough to see that a widow had given two copper coins. And as I mentioned in today's value, about one cent. And that she had given all that she had. You see, in the sight of heaven, it is not really the size of the gift that counts, but the motive that prompts the gift. Heaven is only interested in the amount of love and devotion the gift represents not its monetary value. The love and devotion of the gift is the only basis on which God rewards human beings. In this story, the rich gave from the surplus, and it cost them nothing to give. The value of their gifts in terms of love and devotion was probably very little or nothing, because their gifts represented no denial for self. The love and devotion that is seen by the, 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 the poor woman, the devotion of her gift, is the only basis on which God rewards human beings. So she was rewarded by the commons because God could see inwardly. In this story, the rich gave from their surplus and it cost them nothing to give. The value of their gifts in terms of love and devotion was very little. The widow, however, gave from a heart overflowing with love for God and as such she gave all that she had. Ellen G. White in Councils on Stewardship pages 175, provides the following explanation. Jesus understood the poor woman's motive. She believed 
the service of the temple to be of God's appointment. And she was anxious to do her utmost to sustain it. She did what she could. And her act was to be a monument to her memory through all time. And her joy in eternity. Helen White goes on to say her heart went with her gift. Its value was estimated. Not by the worth of the coin, but by the love to God and the interest in his work that that prompted the deed. Another very significant point is that this is the only gift Jesus ever commented on, in spite of the fact that he speaks significantly about money. Note that this was a gift to a church. That was just about to reject him, a church that greatly deviated from its calling and mission. And yet this gift had immense value because it came from the heart in spite of what the church was all about. Amen. In Acts chapter 10, we come across Cornelius, a Roman centurion that receives a visit from a heavenly angel. The question is, why did this Roman centurion receive a visit from a heavenly angel? Why did he? Well, let's read Acts chapter 10, verses 1 to 4. There was a certain man in Caesarea called Cornelius, a centurion of what was called the Italian regiment. Verse 2, a devout man and one who feared God with all his household, who gave alms generously to the people and prayed to God always. Verse 3. About the ninth, the ninth hour, that's 3, 3 p.m. in the afternoon of the day, he saw clearly a vision, in vision, an angel of God coming in and saying to him, Cornelius. Verse 4. <laughs> and when he observed him, he was afraid and said, What is it, Lord? So we said to him, your prayers, Cornelius, and your alms have come up for a memorial before God. I want you to pay attention to that verse. God pays attention to how we react to his amazing love. Which of Cornelius' two actions were noted in heaven? Well, verse, verse 4 provides the answer. His prayers, as well as the motive of his gifts. It is worthy to mention that Cornelius, a Gentile, became a believer in Jesus Christ through the Apostle Peter. As such, Cornelius' gifts were a tangible expression of the sincerity of his inner spiritual life, which was nourished daily by sincere and regular prayers. That combination is it's, it's imperative in our Christian life. The biblical story tells us clearly that our sincere prayers are heard in heaven. And so is noted the motive of our gifts. Jesus tells us in Matthew chapter 6, verses 21, that where your treasure is, there your art will be also. Treasure is that on which a person sets his or her heart, regardless of intrinsic value. Cornelius was a generous giver. It is obvious that his heart followed his gifts. Prayer and alms giving, my friend and my brother and my sister, or offerings are closely linked and demonstrate our love to God and our fellow man. I'm going to quote what, what uh, Greg mentioned from Matthew in Luke. Luke chapter 10, verses 27. And I'm going to call these principles. There are two great princi principles in, of God's law. Luke 10, 27. Here's the first. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind. You see, this first principle reveals, is revealed in prayer, your prayer life. And the second principle is your neighbor, love your labor as yourself. And this second principle is revealed in almsgiving and offerings. Thank you, Victor. So, Greg, tell us about the big jar. 
The big jar. Well, that's Thursday's <laughs> lesson, the big jar. And it's actually special projects, big jar giving. And just to kind of back up before we get into the lesson, there's research that shows approximately 10% of our net worth is in what we typically call liquid assets. That's, you know, cash, uh, checking, savings accounts, money market funds, things like that. Things that can be readily converted into cash. And that's why we'll call this source of funds small jar, just metaphorically. The remaining 90% of our net worth could be tied up in much less liquid assets, such as real estate, pension funds, it could be art if you happen to invest in those areas. And these usually take more time to convert into cash, so that's why we're going to call this source of funds Big Jar. And I think Victor made such an important point that really needs to be understood before we go further, and that is, it's not the amount that matters. God's not looking at a dollar amount. But he's looking on the motive of the heart. And the motive on the heart, as Victor had said, with, with uh, these wealthy people giving um, you know, a certain amount, it amounted to like 1% or like a penny's worth because they had so much money. Yet that widow had nothing and she gave everything that she had. It's the motive of the heart. So keep that in mind as we're going through this lesson because I don't want it to be misunderstood that, oh, I need to be paying attention to the big jar. That's a motivation from our walk with the Lord and how he motivates us. And it's just where we get access to those funds. That's why we're calling it the small jar and the big jar. So again, most people give their, their offerings or contributions from the small jar, such as their checking and savings account, because they're readily accessible. However, when we're especially convicted in the heart, when the Lord really convicts us in our heart that we can do more. He, he inspires us to give more. That's usually where we have to go to the big jar and take a significant portion of what we have set aside and give to the Lord. So that's where we're going with this day's lesson. But the Bible provides us with some examples of the concept of giving from the big jar. And Victor gave an example there with Cornelius. But let's look at uh, three other examples of what is meant. I think you understand the concept, but we're just going to go through this anyway so that we can more or less solidified. If we look at, in our first example, Mark chapter 14, verses 3 through 6. And this is where Jesus is in Bethany. He's, um, I'm going to go ahead and read this. And being in Bethany at the house of Simon the leper, as he sat at the table, a woman came having an alabaster flask of a very costly oil of spikenard. Then she broke the flask and poured it on his head. But there were some who were indignant about among themselves about this and said, why was this fragrant oil wasted? For it might have been sold for more than 300 denarii and given to the poor. Keep in mind, 300 denarii was equivalent back then to about a year's wages. That's rather substantial, especially from someone who was not wealthy. And so they criticized her and they criticized her sharply. But Jesus said, let her alone. Why do you trouble her? She has done a good work for me. So in verse 6, Jesus is rebuking them, saying, she's done a very good work for me. Let her alone. What's interesting, too, is if we look at John chapter 12, verses 2 through 8, he goes through the same uh, description here, but he gives another description, an additional description, that is that, um, that she poured the oil on Jesus' feet and wiped it with her hair as well. So she, she obviously did both of those, pouring it on the head and, and pouring it on the feet. But the point being of this is, what would move Mary to do such a beautiful work with such a costly offering for Jesus? And obviously, the cost of the oil was insignificant compared to the love she had for Jesus and what value Jesus was to her and what he meant to her. This offering is an example of giving an offering from the big jar. Our second example comes from Acts, chapter 4, verses 33 through 37. And with the great power, the apostles gave witness to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. Nor was there anyone among them who lacked. So these were some pretty well-to-do people. Okay. For all who were possessors of lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of the things that were sold. We talked about this earlier in the week's lessons and laid them at the apostles' feet and they distributed to each as anyone had need. And Joseph, who was also named Barnabas, was an apostle 
and he was also a Levite of the country of Cyprus, but he also had land and sold it and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. So as we know, Barnabas and the multitude, they had land, but they believed in the resurrection of Jesus Christ, and they took that to heart and were inspired to sell chunks, take you know, a significant amount from the big jar and give as an offering. So they sold their land and they placed the proceeds at the, um, at the apostles' feet. And again, why would they do this? Because they were profoundly impacted by their belief in Jesus Christ and what he has done for them. Our last example, example number three, is from Matthew 27, verses 57 through 60. Now when evening had come, there came a rich man. This is the time of Jesus' death and crucifixion and death. Now when evening had come, there came a rich man from Arimathea named Joseph, who himself had also become a disciple of Jesus. This man went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Then Pilate commanded the body to be given to him. When Joseph had taken the body, he wrapped it in a clean linen cloth and laid it in his tomb, which he had hewn out of the rock. And he rolled a large stone against the door of the tomb and departed. Now, Joseph of Arimathea, he was a disciple of Jesus and he was also a council member. Think about this. He was a council member. And at the time when Jesus was not popular, he was just put to death. For him, as a council member, to go to Pilate and ask for Jesus' body and that expression of donating his tomb, his new tomb, for Jesus, give me the body and let me take care of this. That's, that's the amount of conviction and motivation that was in Joseph's heart was because of what Jesus meant to him. He was putting aside all those other um, surrounding attributes that would have put pressure on him to not draw attention to himself. There is also um, other examples of the big jar offerings in scripture that are motivated by the conviction of the heart but i want to also read this jesus tells us and we had just read this uh, victor had just read this for uh, wednesday's lesson but jesus tells us and again it's so important to remember this because it comes down to the question we're going to ask at the very end and that is matthew chapter 6 20, verse 21 for where your treasure is there your heart will be also and I'd like to conclude this day's lesson by reading some that Ellen White mentions in Testimonies for the Church, Volume 2, and it's on page 573, because I love how she spells this out. This takes, um, it helps to give us a fuller, deeper understanding of what Jesus was talking about in Matthew 6.21. So she says, they, they were to bring tokens of their gratitude to God for his continual mercies and blessings bestowed upon them. These offerings were varied according to the estimate which the donors placed upon the blessings they were uh, privileged to enjoy. Thus, the characters of the people were plainly developed. Those who placed a high value upon the blessings which God bestowed upon them brought offerings in accordance with with their appreciation of these blessings. Those whose moral powers were stupefied and benumbed by selfishness and idolatrous love of the favors received, rather than inspired by fervent love for their bountiful benefactor, brought meager offerings. Thus, their hearts were revealed. That goes right to the crux of it. What is in our heart? What's the motivation of our heart? It's not a matter of writing a check or giving a donation, a donation with a large amount of money behind it or large assets behind it. It's the motivation of the heart. It's much easier to give land and lots of, um, uh, I would say, expensive things as offerings. But if that's plentiful in your life, Really, what's the motivation of the heart? But if you have those things and the Lord motivates you and impresses upon you the value that he has provided for you and how you could do more for him in his kingdom, that's when we're talking about drawing from 
the big jar. So that said, the question that begs all of our attention is, where is your treasure? Where is your heart? Thank you. Amen. Thanks so much. So as we, as we conclude our, our lesson for today, I want to share something with you regarding worship. We talked because it, it seems that all of this giving really comes back to where our heart is with the Lord right. and what we're willing and our, our mode of worship. Mm -hmm. uh, Heavenly Places says, Our house of worship may be very humble, but it is nonetheless acknowledged by God. So no matter how humble we are, God um, acknowledges us. Mm -hmm. If we worship in spirit and in truth and in the beauty of holiness, it will be to us the very gate of heaven. That's beautiful. A lesson of wondrous works of God are repeated, and as the heart's gratitude is expressed in prayer, song, and, and our angels from heaven take up the strain and unite in praise and thanksgiving to God. So as we give back to God through this, through worship, angels literally join us. These exercises drive back the power of Satan. They expel murmurings and complainings, and Satan loses ground. God teaches us that we should assemble in the house, his house, to cultivate the attributes of perfect love. Thus will fit the dwellers of earth for the mansions of Christ, that Christ has gone to prepare for those who love him where from Sabbath to Sabbath, from one moon to, new moon to another, they will assemble in the sanctuary to unite in loftier strains of song in thanksgiving and praise to him that sitteth upon the throne and to the Lamb forever and ever. Amen. So let's pray. Amen. Lord, we want to thank you for this wonderful lesson today, Lord. Yes, Lord. And we just pray, Lord, that our love will reflect your love for us in what we give back to you, Father. Sometimes our hearts are hardened and we don't even realize it. So, Lord, bring to mind these hardened hearts and make us, give us a heart of flesh, which you promised to do. So, Father, as we, as we go through this day, Lord, we pray that we will continue to give in, in our, our abundance, in our, our song, in our praise to you, Lord, and in our worship. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Happy Sabbath, everyone. Happy, Happy Sabbath. Sabbath.